Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you to take your seats. And welcome to this high panel discussion, Your Excellencies, and special representative, ministers. Just a few practical information. You have translation in French and English and other languages available uh, with your headphones. We're going to start with uh, two opening words from Minister Abella, but we thank for receiving us here uh, at the United Nations, followed by Ms. Ruiz Arba as a special representative on international migration of the Secretary General. And then we'll have a panel discussion, and Ms. Arba has just informed us that she will be able to stay with us at the beginning of this panel discussion with our distinguished guests from uh, ICMP, I'll take them in order of seats, ICMPD, France, uh, obviously Malta, the Republic of Malta. We have His Excellency, the Foreign Minister, uh, of t the Republic of Tunisia, um, the EU um, uh, delegation represented here as well, and Francesco Rocca from the International Red Cross Federation. So, please, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours with the, your introductory statement. Good morning to everyone. Um, dear colleague, Minister Jinawi. UN Special Representative for International Migration, Excellences, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'm honored to welcome you to this high-level panel debate in which Malta has joined forces with Tunisia, France, the European Commission, and the International Center for Migration Policy Development. Today we have an opportunity to reflect on the opportunities offered to us by a more balanced narrative on migration and the media's role in shaping public attitudes vis-a-vis -vis this issue. Notwithstanding the fact that human mobility has been a global phenomenon throughout human history, it remains a contentious and polarizing issue, particularly when it is irregular as opposed to legal migration. It raises a multitude of emotions, of compassion, of empathy, and of humanity, but also negative ones of prejudice, intolerance, and fear of being taken over by a Trojan horse or of losing one's identity, control, safety, and jobs, amongst others. Of course, having an agreed framework for legal migration, coupled with genuine efforts for integration in the host societies is the ideal way forward. Yet it is a fact that we are still facing a reality of frequent irregular arrivals that need to be managed, keeping in mind that we are dealing with human beings and not statistics. Fear of migrants and refugees must be acknowledged and taken seriously, but countered by messages that combat myths and explain migrants' contribution to our social and economic development. Counter-narrative campaigns, be they at the national or supranational levels, go a good way to ally fears and prejudice. However, such campaigns on their own are never enough. For countries like my country, Malta, those present here today and other frontline states that are most exposed, mass migration, migration is a challenge. However, we are all aware that with challenges come opportunities. Long-term opportunities are difficult to communicate in the light of highly visible short-term costs. In this regard, there is an urgent need to allow our perception on migration to evolve into a more holistic one. And there is no better way of doing, of doing so than through the media, as the media have a crucial role in the shaping of public opinions and attitudes. In, today, in today's day and age, tragedies get more likes and views. 
as the saying goes, if it bleeds, it leads. More than ever before, there is a dire need to rebalance the narrative on migration by promoting and rewarding journalistic excellence in covering migration. This does not mean that the responsibility lies exclusively with the media. Politicians and others have a, have a very important role to play in this matter too. A well-documented and balanced narrative would facilitate evidence-based migration policy development and implementation. Towards this end, about two weeks ago, the second edition of the Migration Media Award was held in Tunisia. The first edition was held in Malta in June 2017. The award's objective is similar to this side events, which is to encourage and reward journalistic excellence on migration matters in the Euro-Mediterranean region. We need to see more high quality journalistic works that delve into the subject and present a comprehensive picture on migration. It is important that more journalists there go beyond the sensational and emergency scenarios and help the community discover the reality of common life as a migrant. It is essential to debunk the myths on migration. Today's high-level panel is the start of the exploration of other similar initiatives such as this to engage the media in rebalancing the migration narrative. This, was this would facilitate the development and implementation of migration policies that are evidence-based, which in turn produces more equitable outcomes for all stakeholders, including the migrant themselves. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister, for setting the stage for this uh, panel, which is indeed about giving voice to evidence. I would like now to call to the floor Ms. Ruiz Arba. Um, the same as Mr. Abdallah's first public event was in Malta, was to host the Migration Media Award. Ms. Arba then, for this first edition, gave us a tremendous and inspiring video message, uh, pointing out the need and the re responsibilities of journalists in actually fostering new narratives and helping change this perception. Perception is, as the issue itself, complex. And I'm pretty sure that Ms. Alba will enlighten us further here. Thank you so much. You can stay in your seat if you want, so that your colleagues can see you. Whichever. Unless you want a, you want a floor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Requires some adjustment. Thank you very much. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, partners, um, I always wonder whether you see me as well, whether I'm standing or sitting. Doesn't seem to make very much difference. Uh, allow me to express my thanks first to the governments of France, Malta, Tunisia, the European Union, and ICMPD for organizing today's event and for giving me an opportunity to uh, give you these opening remarks. I'm very happy to be with you today. This event provides us with an opportunity to underscore the importance of having a fact-based narrative on migration. Unfortunately, as we know, we've witnessed in the recent past an alarming growth in negative and inaccurate perceptions of migrants as either burdens or threats in some countries. And unfortunately, some of these perceptions have started to move from the fringes to the mainstream impacting dinner table conversations and actually turning national elections. This makes the adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration in December this year in Marrakesh all the more significant. After months of consultation, stock taking and negotiations, the majority of member states of the United Nations have agreed to the first ever international framework to improve cooperation on migration. The compact represents a significant achievement of multilateralism. Despite the compact being non-legally binding, it certainly has enormous political and moral weight since member states have agreed on the need to improve the management 
of human mobility really for the first time in the history of the United Nations. And while it serves as a reaffirmation of state sovereignty in matters of border control, which I think it's important to stress, the compact also reflects the inevitable interdependence of states and the value of a collaborative framework on an issue that affects all countries and all people. An important aspect of the Global Compact is the promotion, and I use the language of the Compact, of an open and evidence-based public discourse on migration and migrants that generates more realistic, humane, and constructive perception. This is necessary to correct the proliferating negative perceptions of migrants. And indeed, the Global Compact does recognize the complexity of migration, its inevitability, the multitude of factors that trigger individual decisions of people to relocate, and the variety of circumstances under which people eventually settle in host communities. The Global Compact is the culmination of decades' worth of studies, research, dialogues, and debates acknowledging the many benefits that migration brings to states, to host communities, to migrants, and to the people they leave behind, despite the obvious stretches, uh, setbacks, and stresses that migration uh, inevitably also uh, creates at times. I just want to give you maybe two quick examples of the well-documented positive benefits of migration that are very often overlooked in public debate, where the focus is very often on, uh, as has been mentioned before, very dramatic uh, uh, circumstances that do not reflect the reality of most migrants. Migrant workers in higher productivity settings have contributed 6.7 trillion or 9.4% to the global GDP in 2015, and this represents 3 trillion more than they would have had had they remained in their country of origin. Another, I think, important factor that it's important um, to bring back even to national conversations about global migration. Through the 15% of their income that migrants on average sent back to their home countries in the form of remittances, in 2017, nearly $600 billion was remitted internationally, three times greater than the total of official development aid that richer countries sent to the developing world. And approximately 450 billion of this was actually sent to developing countries. And of course, the 85% of their earnings that migrants actually spend in their host communities uh, is spent in the form of taxes and all forms of spendings that actually contribute to the local economy. There are, of course, those instances when international migration can have negative impacts. For example, when large inflows of migrants have a short-term destabilizing effect on local labor markets, particularly if they're not properly regulated, or when large numbers of skilled migrants leave a country to seek work elsewhere, thereby creating labor gaps that may be very difficult to fill. This is often reflected in the expression uh, brain drain, which can easily be turned into brain gain if we have proper practices in place. But over the long term, the evidence is very clear. The benefits of migration, and I stress the benefits of well-managed migration, vastly outweigh the challenges. Migration brings with it prosperity, innovation, and progress. It is a potent motor of development, and needless to say, it is a life-changing experience for generations, migrants and host communities alike. Sometimes, though, even the, more, the most persuasive facts-based arguments related to the management of human mobility cannot compete successfully with deeply held concerns about migration's cultural and social impacts. Despite the economic evidence, there continues to be some wariness, if not outright resentment, towards migrants in many parts of the world. A toxic combination of suspicion and even fear of foreigners 
coming to take away jobs, commit crime, or abuse the welfare system, often permeates the public debate about migration. It's very difficult to respond to the nostalgia for a happier way of life that migrants are assumed to be threatening. For every community welcoming migrants, unfortunately, there are others who respond with great skepticism. We must recognize that different countries and different communities within a given country will have different perspectives on migration. They will have had different experiences, as well as, at any given time, different priorities and different challenges. Both domestically and globally, these concerns should not be dismissed offhand, but rather I think they should be addressed even if, and I stress particularly if, they are misguided. It's not useful, in my view, to position a debate as being either for or against migration. And it's not unreasonable to have concerns about migration, especially if migration is disorderly, poorly managed, and uncontrolled. But these concerns should not be allowed to fall into expressions of racism and xenophobia towards the migrants themselves. We have a responsibility not to exas exacerbate prejudices and tensions with misleading information and biased terminology, including through our use of social media. And let me provide you with a specific example on this question of the use of language. We often hear uh, and see use the term illegal, uh, used to refer to migrants themselves, as in illegal migrants, which of course purports to reflect their legal status but in reality is unduly pejorative and serves to obscure the large variety of reasons why a person may be in a situation of irregularity. It tends to inflate the seriousness of the cause of the ir irregularity, suggesting in fact some criminal activity, when in fact the irregular situation may simply arise from a violation of the terms and conditions of a visa. Similarly, Disaster imagery to describe migration with words such as swarms, invasions, floods, and hordes, often, even when they're at times innocently used, all serve to pollute the public debate and public opinion and eventually lead to insurmountable stereotyping. Dear colleagues, let me conclude with this note of progress. The consultations and negotiations that have taken place here in New York in the past 18 months, leading to the adoption of the text of the Global Compact this summer, in my view, have been con conducted in a serious, sober, and respectful atmosphere, and have, as a consequence, in my view, led to a broader acceptance of policy options that were not necessarily uh, obvious at the outset of this process. For instance, when the Secretary General's report that is entitled Making Migration Work for All was published last January, it recommended that one way, not the only way, but one way to address irregular migration route is through the creation of a variety of legal pathways. That, I think is fair to say, was met with considerable uh, skepticism in the views of some and was somewhat controversial. In the same way, suggestions in the Secretary General's report that responses to situations, to the situation of the irregular migrants should always be addressed on a spectrum of options that could include regularization options. That was also resisted by many. But as the negotiations for the Global Compact progressed and that actually concluded, I think we're seeing more and more member states willing to explore a variety of initiatives to develop migration policies that are demonstrably effective, rooted in evidence and in experience, and likely to foster a healthier climate for the eventual reception and integration of migrants in host communities. The adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration that will take place this December in Marrakesh will be a seminal moment for global policymaking on migration. So as the Global Compact is adopted, we need more, more than ever before, I think, uh, in this process, an accurate portrayal of migrants, an accurate portrayal of migration to help shape public discourse and lead to appropriate policies. 
it's up to all of us, governments, policymakers, the UN system, civil society, academia, the private sector, media, migrants, and host communities to engage responsibly and accurately in making migration work for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Alba. Enlightening, thank you again. Um, pointing out what is in fact in the Compact 2 as Objective 17, where the issue of perception and the issue of uh, reporting is being addressed and setting objectives and how to get there. So we're looking forward for these uh, inspirations in coming months and years um, in trying to change these narratives. I would like now that perhaps we could have a view from the South and from our um, other uh, host, um, Minister Jinawi from the Republic of Tunisia, um, who I believe would like perhaps some introductory words before we move on to, to the panel, Mr. Jinawi. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by expressing my gratitude to my Maltese friend and colleague, His Excellency Mr. Carmelo Abella, the European Union, France, and the IIS, IACMPD for organizing this side event and by thanking all these distinguished panelists taking part in this panel. <clears throat> From my perspective, the facts about migration have to do with history, geography, economy, and perhaps more importantly, responsibility. History because everyone in this room can cite an example of an imminent or more migrants who made history in his recipient country. Geography, since it is very hard to cite any migrant free country. Economy because there is an abundant literature on the contribution of migrants both to their countries of adoption and their countries of origin as it was said earlier by Madame Arbour. Finally, migration has to do with responsibility. As we live in an inter interdependent and connected village in which industrialized countries have a double responsibility towards the population in need in developing world and towards their own populations. I believe that politicians in our country is both in power and in the opposition should have the courage to maintain these facts in their minds, particularly when they are speaking to the public opinion. For us, migratory, migratory phenomena is something permanent and determinant of the world, in particular in the Mediterranean region, which has always symbolized strategic and vital crossroad for world exchange of all types. Unfortunately, the current international situation characterized, among other things, by the upsurge of conflict, the spread, spreading out of poverty, and the exacerbation of disparities within countries and between countries has made of the Mediterranean a scene of countless human tragedies. Despite the very difficult national transitional context which Tunisia is uh, living, and particularly despite of the uh, geostrategic situation where we are, Tunisia raised up to its responsibility and hosted in 2011 in a dignified manner more than 1.2 million Libyan and foreign refugees, almost 10% of its own population. It was as if Europe received 50 million migrants in a few weeks. Proportionality is a key notion here for government and the media. Till today, my country is home for two thousands of foreign nationals, Libyan, Syrians, and sub-Saharan African, who fled the cows in their res respective countries. These refugees and migrants live in Tunisia in full respect of their human rights, and they are well integrated within the Tunisian social setup and enjoying all the benefit which Tunisian citizens enjoy from the state. 
government institution and Tunisian civil society, with the support of international organization, in particular IOM, UNHCR, ICRC, the ICMPD, and our partners in France are today working together to further strengthen the protection of the rights of the rights of migrants in Tunisia. In addition, a law on preventing and combating human trafficking was adopted in August 6, uh, 2016. This law is a landmark step in our effort to cater with all aspects of this issue. Globally, and as we prepare to adopt the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, Le Pacte Mondial sur la Migration, we believe that it is time for all components of the international community to combine efforts so as to better manage the scourge of irregular migration, better answer the people's aspiration, and preserve all human beings' dignity. Though not binding, the Global Compact will, we hope, set in motion a global and genuine cooperation on migration based on empirical data and on the principle of shared but differentiated responsibility, or cooperation that addresses the structural cause of poverty, which leads to irregular migration, strengthens the channels for regular migration, and promotes integration of migrants in host countries, or cooperation that facilitates financial transfers, strengthen the fight against trafficking from both sides, from the south, uh, south countries, but also from the north, and various forms of discrimination, and facilitate the safe return and readmission. My country is working hard to discourage its national to migrate illegally. In, this, in the same context, we are working with our European partners to implement a true mobility partnership. And we are in a phase, a quite advanced phase, in negotiating the, that kind of new partnership focused on an inter interdependence between the concerted management of legal migration and the fight against a regular one. We have already concluded a number of agreements with our partners on regular immigration, and we are aiming to develop a new win-win concepts for organized and regulated migration responding to the needs of our European partners in human and workforces and contributing to the development of the region providing migrants. In the same time, regarding the admission of third countries, nationals, including those rescued at sea, Tunisia has always respected and will continue to respect all its international obligations and commitment emanating from the pertinent convention it has already ratified. Mr. Moderator, let me close by stating the obvious. Young people across the world are risking their lives in desert and seas because of conflict and because of poverty. A straightforward solution cannot stem from something other than our commitment and tangible work to resolving pending conflict, particularly in Africa, in Libya next door, preventing new wounds, building peace and institutions in war torn and post-conflict countries, and mobilizing all resources for sustainable and comprehensive development around the world. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Minister Jinawi, for highlighting the responsibilities upheld by Tunisia in also welcoming large numbers of migrants, but also refugees. Um, the opportunities that have been uh, underlined in the three first intro introductory speeches um, are very important in bringing us towards potential positive narratives on migrations, which are often forgotten about. I would like now to hear the views of France on how these narratives are impacting on, on the shaping of policies that, that would address the issue of migration. And then we'll move on to a, an open discussion with our panelists. 
So um, I'll give you a word to Alexis Lamec, who is um, director for United Nations and international organizations, human rights and francophonie from the French Republic in New York. Merci, uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, le, m, Mr. Uh, Minister, Madam the Special Representative. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we don't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, simplistic uh, narratives about migration today. Uh, we uh, notice an uh, uh, increasing trend trying to focus on the negative aspect in that regard that the European continent is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not alone. Uh, uh, it's also an example, you know, and uh, we have this uh, declaration, which are fantasy. We have uh, now to present a, a speech and a narrative that is based on the uh, data, on facts, and immigration, what is uh, properly managed, can c contribute uh, positively to the development of the wealth of uh, uh, society. And I think the special representative you've uh, demonstrated, uh, the, you know, uh, spectacularly well, you know, how it can be done of 25 percent of the French people, you know, or, you know, can find their origin in another country. And it is in that perspective that the French, through the French Development Agency, you know, action of civil society that promote a, 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 a narrative that is promoting the qualities of the migrants here at the national level. France has also adopted an action plan for international migration and development. And in that plan, we have a strategic objective which consists in the promotion of a responsible narrative through the valorization of the contribution of migrants to development. So the, now those who would like to, you know, change our values, uh, you know, based on fears, you know, we have to remind them of one thing. Migrants are people and they have their dignity. They're entitled to their dignity. They're entitled to their rights and those rights and their dignity should be protected in all circumstances with no exception. At the same time, we would be naive to, you know, uh, not talk about the negative consequences for the uh, uh, uncontrolled migration that we see that in the media every day you know all these people who die in the oceans you know in the desert you know and uh, also we see all many uh, migrants who are exposed to the violation of their rights in Libya or elsewhere the difficulties of migration are in a completely different order the challenges that are you know uh, that uh, host societies are facing you know they're not necessarily prepared to you know for this uh, strong influx of migrants and they don't necessarily have the resources to integrate them very well at the same time we have to be very very, uh, you know, so we have to, you know, stay away from uh, uh, the speeches of fear. You will also have to, you know, uh, you know, uh, stay away from, you know, people who are, uh, you know, naive. You know, the French president doesn't believe, you know, the conditional opening of all borders, but he doesn't believe, you know, in the policies based on wars. You know, in fact, uh, you know, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, we concentrate our efforts on, you know, uh, uh, to limit the negative aspects of, you know, uh, disorganized migration. We have an adversity that French, with its partners, is working. Working with uh, on a constitution to uh, coordinate everything between host countries and transit countries, uh, you know, uh, you know, and uh, welcome and to uh, you know around the, the Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean basin, you know, in this context and um, you know facing contexts that are uh, based on the exclusive and subjective representations, uh, the promotion of uh, the, uh, of a speech that is based on, on a, a objective vision and documented vision, a balanced vision of migration is needed, you know, in the global pact, uh, you know, migration, you know, uh, uh, you know which will be adopted in Marrakech in December and which French supports, you know, uh, can contribute and can be a very positive factor because, you know, among the uh, goals of the, you know, uh, uh, Global Compact, uh, Goal 17, the promotion of uh, speech based on facts, on data, you know, that is very important to uh, change the, the public perception of migration. So to build a positive narrative on migration, all those who are participating to the public debate, experts, media and uh, politicians have a responsibility, you know, we have to have a a calm, you know, and serene public debate about that, you know, and it's a necessary condition so that the deciders, you know, can, you know, um, propose, you know, a reasonable argumentation, you know, when faced with xenophobia or alarmist, you know, narratives, you know, this. Now, to make that possible, we need to understand better the migration phenomenon by, uh, you know, getting more data about it and sharing this data uh, uh, about migration. We also, you know, share better uh, our information, you know, about migration by educating better our uh, people and especially the youth, think, you know, and France in that uh, aspect, you know, that the very first goal of the Global Pact, you know, on migration is dedicated to that issue, the issue of dedication, the uh, um, 
national, the international uh, or global platform for knowledge, uh, the global knowledge platform in the pack, you know, provides, you know, for sharing of all this useful information about migration. So then in conclusion, I would like to underscore one more time that you do have a, a, a balanced narrative, you know, uh, be heard by our citizens. You know, it's very important to uh, improve uh, tremendously the international governance of uh, migration, f you know, uh, flows, you know, because as long as migrants will be victims of violation of their rights, you know, you know, and as long as we don't, uh, you know, tackle the root cause of migration, you know, and uh, as long as, you know, uh, uh, challenges, as long as, you know, migration won't be uh, controlled and won't be uh, managed in a responsible fashion, the, uh, you know, narrative that, you know, uh, put the, the end and uh, put the emphasis on negative aspects, you know, uh, will be, be, be uh, dominant and it will be difficult to listen to something else. Francis is convinced that you know, the implementation of the Global Pact for Migration in a sure, uh, orderly and regular fashion will be uh, uh, positive for the migration and will help, you know, to fight against these unbalanced uh, narratives. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Lamek, to remind us uh, you know, of all these uh, challenges that uh, we have to work on before we can move towards a new narrative about migration, you know. And I would like now to have Dr. Spindelega as the Director General of the uh, International Center for Migration Policy Development to detail to us a number of activities, a number of endeavors that have been led both on the policy-making side but also on the perception-making side. I'm glad to say that with the Thompson Foundation, we associated ourselves with ICMPD to run this Migration Media Award that has been hosted by Malta first, then Tunisia, and that will continue not to hold the pen of journalists to tell them what to write, but to make sure that they are properly trained understand the complexity, understand the use of words, as Ms. Alba has mentioned before. Words can kill. Words need to be accurate. And in this, in this endeavor with ICMPD, we have led a number of activities of which I'm sure the Director General will mention, including training and, and Migration Media Award. Thank you so much, uh, dear ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Alba, great pleasure to be with you. I would like to start to give you a short example how it is discussed today and how it is different from years before. I was in summer times in the very western part of Austria, in a village with about 250 inhabitants uh, in the Alps. And sitting together in the evening, I asked, uh, what are the main problems? And the answer was migration situation. So I asked, how many migrants do you have in this village? The answer was not a single one. So what is the personal experience of you? Do you have, because of your families, uh, a lot of problems? Answer, no. But it is the big, big problem. So why do people in a small village in the Alps in the western part of Austria think about this? Because of what they hear every day in media. And I think uh, this is a very good example you could find in nearly every country in Europe, that uh, people are now very sensible about the issue. And this is different. Ten years ago, we had a big discussion all over the world about the financial crisis situation. But if you would have asked people in this western part of Austria if they are touched by this, they would not have raised this issue. So this is the big difference. Everybody can think about it because of... Uh, what they hear in media, and they would like, uh, of course, to see solutions. They would like to see action because of this. And if you have a look to media, and they play, I think, the most important role in that, it is not really balanced what, what you can read and hear every day out of media. It's more black and white. You are very much in favor, or you are totally against the migrants. And there is nearly nothing in between. But the world is not black and white, it is colorful. We all know that. And I think for that, it is really a need to come to a different narrative, to, of course, convince also media that they are looking more to the balanced reporting, looking to this and that side, because otherwise we will separate society more and more and you will only send, stand on the one or the other side. And if you don't understand the other side, there will be no solution at the end. 
So what we created, and I'm very glad that Malta in the presidency of European Union was starting with that, we said, why not creating an award for those journalists who are giving a balanced reporting? Let's have a look around the Mediterranean, which country, what kind of journalists are going to do this balanced reporting, and then let's award them. And there was a big ceremony organized in Valletta, wonderful premises outside. And of course, this was the starting point. And now, Your Excellency, we have been to Tunis uh, to do it for the second time. And I think this is something where you really can uh, yeah, give an award to people who try to start with a different narrative, who try to, to give a uh, perspective uh, that is really more balanced, to look to both sides, and for that uh, also to yeah, start with a bridge over these two sides and uh, to use all these opportunities to become more detailed, focused on facts, and to find a solution for that. So I think uh, this is really needed, but as we all know, uh, also in the upcoming European elections next year, there will be uh, a hot discussion about migration. This will influence a lot uh, of the outcomes in the single countries, and uh, we will see how this European Parliament of the future will be a different one from the past. But anyhow, I think uh, initiatives like that could bring us a step forward, could bring us more uh, to have a balanced narrative and maybe to overcome this black and white situation. I hope that very much, and I thank you all for being so much active in that. Thank you, Dr. Spring, Delega. We've been very talkative yet already, and I'm afraid that Ms. Alba has to leave us already to meet uh, of a commitment. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Spindelega. Um, ignorance breeds fear, and indeed, uh, we've been trying to address that issue with support from the European Commission. Most of our activities in trying to address these narratives have been financed by the, the Geneer. Um, we have a representative of the Commission here in the person of uh, Antonio Parenti as a principal negotiator on, for, the EU, on, for the Global Compact. And, and the EU has stressed that both there's a need to have new migration policies and it's fostering some, or trying to foster a discussion but there's also a need to support independent journalism and to make sure that independent journalism is better equipped to address this issue of a narrative. So perhaps we could have your views in contribution to this panel discussion, Mr. Parenti. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thanks, first of all, to uh, the host uh, of this, I think, extremely interesting uh, debate. It's a very timely debate. Um, And I heard a lot of very interesting and pointed uh, intervention this morning. And I think they are all extremely uh, clear on one point. Data is incontrovertible. The short term may be complicated, but the long term is clear. There is a benefit from, from migration. But I mean, if you look at personal experience and you look at your own country, I think you're all aware that data is not what changes art. It's difficult to have a debate, a political debate about data. Uh, and the problem is not so much the data or the reality. The, the problem is the perception of the reality. Uh, I was on a conference a few days ago and a minister was telling, uh, it was a finance minister, someone who also had problems in that front if you want. It's not, the reality of politics today is not whether you are right or wrong, it's whether you are perceived to be right or wrong. So how do we change perception on migration? Because we know the data now. And I think this is not an easy task. I mean, these days, public opinions are formed often on social media. So even a step away sometimes from, from journalism. But not a distant step. Journalists are still 
an important part of what is being discussed in social media. Look at any, any debate today, and you can see that very often there's a reference to journalistic sources. So journalists have, I think, an incredible duty uh, these days. They have a duty to push, fuel, and support the right debate, or ask the right questions, pretend the right answers. And let, let's take it back to, to, to migration. The debate in Europe, for example, I'm sorry talking about Europe, but being a European is, more, is, more, is easy for me. The debate about Europe is how to stem migration. But we don't have a problem of stemming migration. Migration, to a large extent, has been stemmed in Europe. We are, going, we are down to the thousands these, these years, up from or down from the tenth of thousand to the hundred of thousand of migrants. The problem now is about integrating migrants. But the debate is not about to integrate. It's difficult to find stories in the media, reported in social media, on how to integrate migrants. So a plea for journalists is indeed these to keep on fueling the right type of debate. Of course, journalists cannot do it alone. They need politicians. They need responsible politicians to look at the long term, which is a difficult side, and, and I'm hearing company of politicians, so I think you are right in, in understanding it is a difficult debate because you have to come to election on a, on a regular basis. But the long term solution has to be one of facilitating a discourse which is data based, which is in the long term interest of a country. And I think the politician in this case deserve at least a little bit of a kudos for having facilitated the conclusion of the Global Compact of Migration. This is a very important step. I've been honored to represent, together with many other uh, colleagues, uh, part of the European Union in that, those negotiations. And I think that together with our African friends, our, our Arab friends, we managed to find a document which as the correct balance, as the correct balance of forward-looking, but also of managing the floods of migrations, managing migration to make it responsible, real, and advantageous for everyone. So I think if we all go in the right direction, the European Union has been clearly in support of all of this, including by uh, supporting this type of initiative, I think we can try to turn the perception and arrive at the result we all need, which is to have the perception matching the reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parenti. Indian perception is a complex phenomenon, probably as complex as migration. Um, for instance, few of us know that Europe is a continent that probably has more nationals living in other continents than any others. We have more European migrants, the, but they're called expats, living outside Europe than any other continent has its own nationals living outside. And that's a, that's a fact which is not so often well perceived or known. So perception of reality um, is really a challenge. And it can become a burning issue. And I think, Francesco Roca, you come from a country where it has become a, a burning issue. And we would like to hear from you both as president of the uh, Italy Red Cross, but also as president of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, have, how do you see, what are the narratives in your country and what you've seen also with your experience all over the world as president of the International Federation, which are these narratives that are constraining politicians and policies? Uh, microphone, please. The inter. Yeah. Uh, yes, you 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 are very right. In Italy, we can uh, testify how rapidly shift uh, the the mood of the the civil society in dealing with the with migration. The perception of the impact in the daily life uh, of, a, of a country, again, uh, only about perception. How important is um, 
how the politicians has feeded this perception. Because sometimes uh, this is, I would like uh, maybe just to, to <laughs> underline something that, uh, because you stated several times the, about the, the media responsibility, which of course is very important. But then, uh, of me, in, 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 coming from the experience of my country, the journalists uh, most of the time reported what they have listened from the politicians. Nothing less, nothing more. And this has feeded uh, this uh, shift of the mood in the civil society. And we are confronting and defending. Uh, the, uh, we, we feel that we are really in the front line on defending the, the very essence of the humanitarianism in this moment uh, in Italy and in other countries of Europe. Uh, because when you are defending uh, or standing up for the dignity of the human being, you are uh, uh, immediately perceived as politicized. Neutrality, which has distinguished always the NGOs, the role of the humanitarians in the field, now is criticized. You are taking side if you defend or try to protect the dignity and the life. And the perception, I always use an example uh, in the discussion that uh, we, we, the discussions that we have uh, in Italy, but not only in Italy, in, uh, all over the world. But this is so important in this moment in Italy and in Europe. No one is questioning the role of the firefighters when he arrives uh, to save lives uh, in a building in fire. While it has been uh, criminalized, uh, the role of the NGOs uh, saving lives in the Mediterranean. This is uh, the shift, uh, the best example of perception. And in this, maybe we can add uh, that there has been uh, maybe a responsibility of the media too. A responsibility of the media too not only of the politicians. Because again, talking about facts, number, and the increasing number of deaths, this is a, again a matter of fact, not a matter of perception. But unfortunately, this is uh, what we are facing. But it is also a good example that we should uh, maybe uh, underline and uh, create may maybe better condition to be known. I would like maybe to, to give you an example about an hosting center of the Italian Red Cross in Settimo Torinese, a little city close to Turin, 50,000 inhabitants. And through our hosting centers in three years passed uh, more than uh, 42,000 uh, asylum seekers. And uh, with a brilliant leadership of the municipality, and of my colleagues of the Italian Red Cross who are working in the Austin Center, we work side by side with the community without any accident, without any episode of xenophobia. Think about uh, 42,000 people in transit uh, in, a, in a so little town. This is because we, had, uh, we started uh, to work in the school, to work in the neighborhood, presenting the case, uh, talking about the people as a human beings, mother, father, sister, daughters and their background, their story, what they have left, and why they have decided, or why they have forced to flee their own country. And this has been uh, something uh, that uh, has been uh, a successful experience, as also the other one uh, in, uh, in Riyadh, which is uh, maybe is not uh, so well known, but uh, Riyadh is a little town in Calabria, a few years ago, it was a, a dying village. It was dying, and many of its houses in disrepair. And this school closed to closing down. And this uh, started to change when a little boat of Kurdish refugees became stranded on a nearby beach. Since then, the town has welcomed some 450 migrants, which is not a big number, but uh, uh, very big for that little village. And migrants now make up one quarter of the population. They were offered housing and training and they helped to rebuild both the town's population and economy. And uh, I could give you a lot of this kind of example of good integration. So the problem is uh, when we will be able to stop this narrative uh, using good example. I welcome uh, the, the media award because this is uh, 
So anyway, maybe we, we, we should have also uh, some, um, something also to, say, to, to blame, because we know perfectly which are the newspaper, which are the, new, the media that are using this kind of, uh, of uh, toxic narrative on a daily basis, feeding this. In Italy, we had a lot of experiences. There was a, a, pro, a TV program every night at 7.30 p.m., starting in feeding with episodes of crimes of the migrants. So, I would also, I had a lot of good example of uh, inclusion uh, story made by the British Red Cross, Canadian Red Cross, about the importance of the local actors and the interaction uh, with, the, with the municipalities, with the mayors of the city, which can play a key role more than the national politicians. The key is in the community. The key for inclusion is in our daily life. Key in, for the inclusion is in our schools, is where the young people live, and also we have a lot of good example, examples uh, in how we are sharing uh, stories of life of people struggling for uh, survive. And this is uh, has been successful. Uh, we, as Red Cross, we are committed uh, to increase our role in the community to sensitize uh, about uh, the life uh, of those who have fled uh, their own country. And uh, again, I don't want to steal uh, so much time, but I, I want to really thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to be part of this important uh, panel. Thank you again, uh, and uh, best wishes for the incoming uh, uh, media awards in Tunisia. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Rokhaim. Thank you for highlighting how polarized perception can be, at the same time giving good examples. And I can tell you that as a member of a jury of a Migration Media Award with my colleague journalists, we've seen many of these incredibly positive stories from your country, Bangladeshi migrants having settled in Palermo, fighting the mafia, refusing to pay racketing, racket money. And that lady, which we helped mentor and supported in an endeavor to, to produce more stories on migration, earned the first prize this year on a wonderful story humanizing the public authorities, the police, um, and the work they're doing in trying to bring back a dignity to migrants, which is not something we hear so often. We tend to hear more, inf to hear more inflammatory um, comments. I would like to give the floor to all of you here present in the room, uh, just raising your hands should you have a comment or questions and, and continue this discussion in a more open and informal way. So please um, raise your hands should you have any questions Yes, we have one at the corner here. Please, if you could quickly introduce yourself. And thank you very much for that very um, stimulating, interesting discussion. Just a couple of points and then a question at the end. First, as, as some of the speakers have said, if there was universal consensus on anything in the Global Compact, it was on the importance of data. I think what has also emerged from many of the speakers is that there is, in fact, a lot of data out there. Um, most of you are familiar with IOM's own uh, data portal that's, that's based in Berlin. So the question really becomes how do you effectively uh, communicate it? Uh, and I don't think that question is, you know, how do you persuade the unpersuadable because none of us in this room can, can probably do that. Um, a big focus here on the media, which we would agree certainly is, is extremely important. Um, however, a distinction has been raised, I think uh, Mr. Parenti in particular pointed out the prevalence of social media. There is mainstream journalism that's reporting on these things and there's social media which can be very, very different. The, the speed with which information or let's say opinions moves around the world by means of social media is, is really striking these days, but that is not journalism. That is not, that is not journalism. Um, I think, uh, and, and some of the speakers touched on this too, um, while media is indeed very important, uh, res res responsible journalists are, are reporting on what's, what's out there. Certainly national leaders and those of us in international organizations and in the UN cannot, um, I, I think, cede our own responsibility to journalists. 
um, we have public affairs teams, all of us, and, and the responsibility, the shared responsibility that is reflected in the Global Compact um, means that, uh, that the responsibility is to reach out proactively to journalists and make sure they get the story right. That, I think, is all of our collective responsibility, not to downplay the challenges, as the SRSG said very well, not to make it rosy, as she has said in the past, but to put out a, a clear picture ourselves on the social media side, you know, to see incorrect or, or xenophobic tweets, respond to them. Now, that could be the full-time job of a 10,000-person public affairs office, and none of us have that, but, but we can try and do our best and certainly reach out um, to the mainstream journalists to to correct this. I want to underscore one final thing because IOM has seen this in all parts of the world, and that is what Mr. Roca said about the community level. That is where change agents reside. When people get to know their neighbors, when kids play with the kids of newcomers, go to school together, um, that is where change can be made and, and, where, and where these narratives can, can spring up sort of from a wellspring of, of where migrants live on the ground. We in the global community are, are maybe not so close to that, but can certainly set, um, can set the moral tone. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you so much. Indeed, uh, on your last point, um, ICMPD has commissioned a study from the uh, Office of Public Attitudes to Migration, which has pointed out something that we heard from the panelists here, that neighboring communities are more afraid the level of threat, of sense of threat, is stronger than within the host communities where migrants live and are usually very well integrated. So this issue of ignorance brings us back to the role of media. You mentioned social media. They do contribute today to an unseen level ever before to the public information debate. And indeed, it raises new challenges. In our project, in our program, we have focused on legacy media, on media outlets, on professional journalists using technique rather than just having a press card. And that technique of checking your information, checking your fact, validating the sources does not exist in social media and that raises challenges indeed. Um, anyone else would like to make a comment and, and raise a question perhaps to, to panelists here? I think Suzanne, you said to mention that you had a question at the end and we didn't hear it, or I'm, maybe I missed it. The question did have to do with, um, with the question of, of local communities and integration at, right. that, at that very municipal s small level, like the small village in the, in the Alps. And I wanted to ask the panelists if in their projects or, or their own communities, you know, what, what has been done in, in that regard and what they have seen. Thank you. So has there been initiatives to take into account success stories? Um, grassroots community level initiatives that would be raised to an, an attention at the national level. Would you, any of you, would like to, to answer to that issue, to that question? Yes, M Minister Abello. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that integration is crucial in this, in this respect. Uh, because as also uh, Mr. Rocca mentioned, um, when you have positive experiences, uh, it's more than than talk itself. I mean, it's 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 not preaching, but actually you're saying what is happening on the ground. Um, we in in Malta we uh, have, uh, or rather published, which is uh, there is a document on integration, uh, which is up for consul consultation. Uh, this document does not only talk about integrating migrants. I think at times, uh, if we talk on integration and only focusing on the issue of migrants who might have stereotypes in, in, in this area as well. So integration um, is dealt with in a broad manner, not only uh, when it comes to migrants, it can be also uh, other minorities, irrespective of what uh, is the issue. So I think it is important to work on the integration. We know of experiences, for example, at school level, Children do not distinguish um, whether um, the, their chi the, the child sitting next to them comes from a neighborhood village or from another country. Children, 
don't have these um, uh, these issues at, at mind in, in in their mind. So so I think they can teach us how to integrate better than 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 others because we we do have um, different perceptions of and and pass judgments on on this. So I think there are uh, these positive examples which need to be um, made known to others uh, rather than only discussing but uh, having this positive narrative and this, this is the scope of uh, or at least partially it is the scope of this uh, meeting here today uh, that in, together with the difficulties with the challenges that we have but to present also the positive narrative the the examples that are really happening at the moment a positive narrative does not mean that we hold the hand of a journalist hiding under the carpet everything negative, difficult, but pointing it out in a balanced way. And we've awarded a first rush radio in Arabic this year, the Migration Media Award, to an incredible story from Radio Tatawin in your country, Minister from Tunisia, Minister Janawi, uh, a wonderful work of uh, how the local community welcome uh, the uh, migrants that have crossed the deserts and find a uh, potential first assistance. Um, you mentioned that Tunisia was doing its duty, and it is doing a tremendous duty. In shaping these new policies that you had recently, we mentioned the law on tr human trafficking being adopted in, in Tunisia. How do you cope with these perceptions, these comments from the media? Freedom of press is now fully supported in Tunisia, and you've been setting an example there too. Um, so how do you cope with these two potentially conflicting uh, perceptions and conflicting phenomena? I would like to go back to the example of uh, to, to, uh, Tunisia of 2011. Uh, we welcome more than a million uh, refugees in 2011. I mentioned it, and uh, most of them, as you you uh, mentioned, uh, most of those uh, uh, migrants are coming from Libya were integrated in a natural way. There was no problem. Uh, the local population welcomed them. They've been uh, accepted by families. Their children were uh, schooled. They've been schooled, you know, and uh, they, they were stayed almost two years in the southern part of our country and they weren't schooled you know they, they could come into hospitals in Tunisia they were welcomed and I think the international community did not really watch and did not hear much about this million of uh, refugees and migrants came to through Tunisia for one year we hosted them and we managed them uh, thanks to the support of uh, several international organizations but you know it, they didn't make the news uh, 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 you know and that's too sad but there was a, a natural you know uh, a willingness from the Tunisian people to help them and to treat them properly. But I would like you know, mention another issue, if you don't mind. The issue of the migration is an issue that is going to last. It's not going to go away. It's not... A, um uh, it's not something that's going to disappear overnight, you know, uh, like that. So instead of uh, being uh, f so focused and uh, maybe obsessed about the consequences of this, uh, you know, uh, about the, the, uh, or, or to be obsessed with the uh, uh, migration, so I think we should, uh, you know, uh, talk more about the causes, the root causes of migration, and these causes are, are clear. We, in Africa, we have countries, we have states that are, you know, suffering from uh, tremendous insecurity and the lack of good governance. And therefore, our European friends, our Western world friends, you should help those African countries to solve their conflicts and possibly to build institutions that can manage, uh, can help them manage the, the matters of their countries. You know. Secondly, we focus on two phenomena, migration and terrorism. You know, people talk a lot about that. You know, this is important. It's key, sure. But look at the look at Libya, for example. It's a textbook case. You know, Libya. Our European friends, and I have uh, one of them next to me right here. You know, you know, we they focus on migration coming either from Libya or you know uh, transiting, uh, going through Libya. So, and us through our in our dialogues with our friends in Europe, we said, you know, you should make an extra effort to help. Libya to uh, solve its uh, problems. If you have a strong state, you know, in Tripoli, 
territory that is able and can manage its borders. You know, you don't have need, you don't need to deploy armies in the Mediterranean Sea to prevent those migration uh, flows coming from the south. You know, unfortunately, firstly, there's no unanimity in the side of Europe. You know, Europe is divided. You have some European countries. You know, and in fact, you know, with uh, non-European countries, you know, so there's a division in the western side, and that they don't see it as an urgency to solve the Libya situation. Uh, and that is why us, we have uh, 500 kilometers of borders with Libya. We believe we're very concerned and we believe that it's an emergency. And before talking about, you know, talking about migration even more, you know, and uh, and uh, to, and to, to uh, you know, well, yes, we to talk about the, the needs of the migrant, but we have to attack, you know, look at the deep root causes of this issue, which are political and military causes, you know. So, um, Sad, the need uh, to address the causes, the roots, um, not only the symptoms. And there's perhaps an initiative that should be mentioned by SCMPD, which is, again, at grassroots level, trying to sensitize municipalities of municipal authorities in trying to design at their level, because they are facing firsthand the burning issues of housing people, feeding them, looking after them. So please, can you describe this initiative, which is called Migration Cities to Cities, I believe? Thank you very much. Yeah, just uh, some, some comments about this. We have made this program now for some years. So big cities, they have all a lot of problems with migration. So to bring them together, to discuss the different issues, and to use an exchange, and to make a positive experience available to others, this is one of these main issues of the city to city program. So there are big cities like uh, Tunis, like Beirut, as well as European uh, cities like Vienna or uh, Italian cities uh, and so on. So they are coming together, uh, talking about the very concrete experience and then to form a program out of that. I think this is most important because you don't have to invent the wheel every time. You can also use the experience from others uh, and then also to start with media experience I think also this is one of the part of the city to city program. So we are very much happy to run this program and this is also one of the positive examples that we should put on the table today. We have, uh, thank you, Dr. Spindalega. We have another 10 minutes together. Um, any questions in the, flo in the audience? I would like to come back perhaps to, to the issue of France um, and your activities. You mentioned AFD, which has uh, which is running a, an important uh, series of programs trying to address these development issues. Um, so perhaps you could uh, tell us a little bit more on, on the link between addressing the root of the problem, as Minister Ginawi underlined, and the issue of migration. Oui. Merci. No, I fear. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank their speakers because this debate was very uh, informative and very interesting. And I think it's t important to broaden the debate. Indeed, uh, you know, we talked about it very clearly about the f fact that it was very important to talk about the, the narrative uh, about migration, the fact that the, the, the you know, way it's presented, you know, gives a bad perception. But, but we have tools for that. And the AFD, the French Development Agency, you know, uh, Mar uh, yeah, has a number of tools that are not dedicated just to attack, you know, root causes, but the qualification, you know, of this, uh, that, that's part of uh, an important part of our activities. So, you know, we, IFD, you know, is, uh, you, you know, we give money for operations out, outside the France, you know, it's as, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's local governments, you know, that are in charge of, you know, uh, tackling uh, migration issues in France. So I would like to go back to issue that, you know, that's, uh, you, Excellency, you uh, talked about, uh, you know, tackling the root causes, a very important issue. Thank you for raising this issue, because it's uh, very important to talk about the symptoms and the root causes are very key. And the two points that you mentioned are very key. In fact, you know, first, the issue of security and the second, governance. And this is why I think, you know, the, and these key are you're totally taken into consideration in the global uh, pact, uh, global compact for migration. And this is the reason why we believe that compact, you know, sends the right messages. You know, it, uh, in fact, we should talk about shared responsibility for all countries and including uh, uh, origin countries, you know, uh, uh, we need to work all 
altogether uh, so that these security issues and governance issues are better taken into account. Um, regarding the first one of those two, you know, security uh, regarding, uh, you mentioned Libya. Of course, that's a priority. You know, the French president has uh, started, tried to take into account, uh, be, 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 you know, uh, beyond the, the just, you know, managing the f flows of migrants, trying to tackle the issue of the, the trafficking, you know, and the sanctioning t the tra traffickers, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and to, uh, to condemn them. You know, we want to go beyond that even further, and we want to attack, you know, the core of the issue, which is the political uh, solution, you know, in Libya. As you said, President Macron has already organized two meetings um, in Paris um, and in, uh, in near Paris uh, since last year, uh, specifically to support uh, the uh, action of the special representative of uh, the General Secret uh, Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Salame, so that we can find a political solution in Libya. You are absolutely right. It's very important to underscore the fact that the best way to take to tackle the issue of the migration is that we need to uh, help Libya to have a strong institution. I would even say institutions, period, you know, because uh, that's what it needs at this time so that it can uh, face the uh, migration issue itself. Uh, Libya. Y yes, it is a key issue. You're right. You know, um, which is in the last seven years, the Commission has been supporting the nation building in, in Tunisia, an institutional build, build set up to the point that now Tunisia is probably the country receiving the strongest EU origin assistance um, in, in, uh, in terms of budgetary assistance, but also project-led uh, activities. Thank you. Yeah, I think, Minister, you touch a point, a fundamental point. It's true. I mean, we have to tackle the root causes of, of migration. Being aware of a little tweak in all of this, which is by developing uh, uh, countries, most often what we have in the short term is an increase of migration, because people feel uh, more empowered to, to travel. But this should not be quite the opposite, the excuse not to intervene. Now, I think we should also be aware of the fact that the European Union has put good governments as the core of its own development assistance towards Africa. And we need to build, and we are putting money where our mouth is. I mean, we, we just launched uh, one year ago an investment plan for Africa, which will work with the help of the African uh, countries, with the help of the European industries, to bring money where more is most is needed and possibly build up also a better governance in, in the way. And I think in this sense, we differentiate from other, from other donors in, in Africa. But it's a long-term, uh, it's a long-term, or at least a medium-term job. And I think the same applies, applies to Libya. Uh, any solution, Libya will require a buying in from the local population and this in the current circumstances remains complicated and I think part of the real focus on uh, on the emergencies but it's not a total focus is a focus which goes along with try to create a better future for for the Libyans and the Libyan country thank you um, we're reaching shortly the end of our discussion and I wanted to perhaps give the floor again to Minister Abella who has been welcoming not only the Migration Media Award but also the EU support asylum office uh, in Malta and has taken the lead with a migration summit that took place uh, uh, during the presidency. Uh, perhaps to, to do some initial concluding remarks and then Mr. Jinawi could uh, perhaps uh, also add his, uh, his own comments if need be. Uh, Mr. Abella. Well, first of all, I thank everyone uh, that uh, on, not only participated but also is present here for this uh, interesting discussion. We mentioned a number of points. Um, I think that we all know what is the way forward in the sense that if, if I recall the Valletta Summit, for example, where uh, we had the meeting in, in Valletta in 2015, uh, we had a summit of between the African leaders and the European leaders, and we agreed on the way forward in the sense that we need to work together. And I think this is crucial, working together, showing solidarity. Uh, it's not only a question of changing the narrative or the perception of what's happening. It's good to have data. It's good to know uh, what's happening in reality, not as a matter of perception. But then it boils down to action. So uh, I definitely agree on tackling the root causes. I definitely agree on uh, taking initiatives uh, in host countries, in countries of transit. 
So definitely there is no one answer to this issue, to managing migration. Uh, we have a multitude of things to, to do at different levels in different uh, uh, countries, regions, uh, and above all, we should do it together. So I think um, working together is a, far, is, is a far better option than trying to either shift the burden on some or on few rather than taking uh, collective responsibility in this issue. And um, with, the, with this, I, I conclude and thank you once again for being here with us. And I hope that we continue to working together um, for uh, the, the better of our societies and of our countries. Thank you. Of course, you know, I mentioned the root causes, but there's another issue, another key issue, which is how do you manage fear? Because this phenomenon is starting to trigger a phenomenon of fear in Europe, which is instrumentalized and used by political forces. And we're facing, uh, uh, you know, where it's a very slippery slope and very dangerous at this stage. And the role of the media is at this in that uh, sense, very key and very important. It's very important that the message that we talked about this morning must be, uh, you know, uh, talked about. And the European public opinion knew, needs to know that the other is not a danger. It can be, in fact, a, a, a source of further wealth, increased wealth. And that's a very key element that could be, you know, key for the future of a number of uh, European countries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Minister. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for having hosting us here at the United Nations and see you soon. Thank you.